Hi, thank you so much. And I don't know if you're going to work or coming from work, so but thank you for being here anyway. And from, so from one interested amateur to another, um, <laughs> the, I'll give you the punchline now in case you have to leave, or indeed in case you just leave. <laughs> um, I think we should teach ergonomics, which is the other name for human factor science, and I think we should teach psychology, which is the other name for behavioural science. So I'm a psychologist and an ergonomist, and that's what I think we should be teaching. Sounds like I'm sort of just kind of doing what suits me. Um, I think patient safety is a goal, and that's the theme. That's what I'm on about. And I think if we teach those things, a bit of psychology, with, which is within the ergonomic landscape, um, which I'll come to at the end, alongside what we teach already in our school, as in um, at like uh, basic sciences, clinical skills, and a wee bit of dare say research sensibility, certainly critical appraisal, evaluation, data type sensibilities. I think you get you get safety emerging from those things. I think there's a danger, and I was charged with, oh, you're a psychologist, do a patient safety module. There's a danger it becomes another thing, and I think I'll try and articulate it. It's already become a bit other. Of course, we're here. It's essentially, patient safety is essentially things like this, someone standing up talking about patient safety rather than something that's more embedded. And so that's, that's kind of like what I'm on about, really, if that makes sense. Um, I have no, I'm not selling anything here really, no, no commercial interest in any particular methods or ways of looking at things. These are just my research funders really, that's how I get, I get paid through my teaching and research. So no, no vested interest. And I think just got this from Bryn earlier, that I think we agree on some of this stuff. I think it is about safe systems, that's your organisational ergonomics, adaptable teams very much again, organisational ergonomics, and then capable staff, and that brings into um, things like interactions with computers, decision making, which is all a bit more of the cognitive ergonomics and the physical design. So that's the kind of that's the kind of theme. So one, it's a goal. If if you're a if you're a I, I did my PhD at the Scottish School of Sports Studies with like um, uh, elite athletes, including the Scottish cricket team. No laughing at the back. <laughs> they were sort of elite within their national context, the Scottish context, um, and then. Um, you don't teach gold medals, you know, you teach biomechanics and physiology and nutrition and technique, you know, and the gold medals, are, they, they come from the system, you know, that's, I know that sounds blind, blindingly obvious, but the second observation, and this probably prompted this title and this talk, is I do see confusion, because you say, well, doing a patient safety course, right, what is patient safety? Well, it, it's a goal, but, but we're teaching patient safety skills, right, okay, so what are they? And then you just end up throwing in other things that are that are there already, like communication skills. Well, that's what that's communication skills. So, so this is the glossary of the, for, from the WHO patient safety curriculum, which is meant for, I think, many professions. Certainly there's a dental component and I think there's certainly medical and nursing. And if you just look at the glossary, it's quite telling as to, for me, as to what a sort of confounded Venn diagram it is. There's a bit of QI type, there's plan, do, study, act in there, there's root cause analysis, okay, there's reporting, and then there's crew resource management, which is your kind of non-technical skills, but then there's like HIV or, and, and ICU and um, antimicrobial resistance, and then there's like <laughs> intravenous, whatever that means, and then sort of like um, things like um, OSCEs are in there, like feedback, various different bugs and... You know, I mean, it just it just looks to me like something where, where yeah, it's patient safety. We kind of all know what that is, so we'll just we'll just talk about clinical and non-clinical and organisational and research and evaluation and QI and and root cause analysis all and just throw it all at it and hope it sticks. You know, and I, I don't think it's easy. I think the problem with it is the fact that it's hard to conceptualise how you teach something that is a goal rather than a process. But they do have this thing, they, they say patient safety skills can be taught. So we had a good look through the curriculum and tried to find out what they meant by a patient safety skill. And of course they mean things like non-technical skills, which I would see as organisational ergonomics, clinical skills, which I would see as clinical skills, and things about decision making, which again I see as cognitive ergonomics. And so that's, that's what I'm on about. And if you, this is... Again, another schematic. I think this is from maybe one of the joint commissions or something. And again, you've got patient safety goals. I think three and four are goals. Maybe improve the safety. Well, that sounds sort of almost tautological. But I think communication is a is a process 
like it's not a goal of it's not a goal of safety to improve communication. It's the other way around, and reducing risk through things like design and good procedures is a way of achieving safety. So I don't think that that is a goal of safety to reduce risk. I think we try and reduce risk and manage it and study it in order to produce safety. I'll just keep going like this, right? So, like, yeah. <laughs> And I, I want to, I, I include myself and in everything here. I, and I do say we, I mean in terms of teaching, because I'm a teacher. I do not mean we in terms of, like, obviously the systems and clinical areas within which many of you work. But I definitely include myself in this sort of landscape. Of the patient safety, and I mentioned this, is, it's, it's not just about the safety of patients. It's a thing. It's doing very well for itself in terms of travel agents and... <laughs> Conference, you know, people who hotel owners, you know, they all like patient safety, as do travel agents, as do people who run events and so on. And um, there's lots of industrial, like, like commercial stuff around learning and <laughs> reporting systems, training, everybody's like, selling something. And in, in our world, you know, we get m metrics and we are evaluated on our ability to publish and to bring in research money and so on. So, you, and, and, and you can win at it. And as soon as you can, as soon as you can win at something, it's more than just the safety of patients. Because I believe that all healthcare professionals have the safety of patients as essentially as a core value and as an inherent thing. But once you start to win at something, you have to do. I think you have a duty then to question its epistemic and its philosophical foundations. You know, are we just doing it for the career here? I'm sorry, you just ask, have to ask the question. I feel I feel that very much myself. Am I researching things that I'm interested in or? that um, I feel have value or am I just, you know, I'm chasing the next metric. I've got to, my, I have to bring in grants above the median for the Russell Group universities and all that, you know. So do, do, am I just going through the boxes? You know? And the, the fundamental thing around the question is this idea of to err, to err is human, because that's where it all begins, <coughs> where it all begins. I basically think human error, uh, human error, as we use it in healthcare, is fundamentally a social construction. Fundamentally. And you know that if you've got children, which I don't have. Um, that, that, um, when, when children fall over, you don't, you don't call it an error. You don't tick non-compliance and have a run chart like, to see whether or not you can like, bring down the falls. You go, wee! Like, there's, no, there's no error. You should do that with trainees. Wee! Um, you, 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 there's no error. That, that is just learning. That's children learning to master their environment and the limits of their physical, physical and cognitive capabilities within a physical space, and they just get better at it. As soon as you impose error on it, you stunt that. And round about the time kids go to school, basically, someone slaps them on the hand at one point and says, that's wrong, and learning basically is never the same again. So... Yeah, to, yeah, to, air, to, to explore your environment and to overcome and adapt, that's the human thing. Animals just have that their whole lives. But we don't. We have error as a blame. It's, in, it's just deeply socially constructed and blame comes with it. And it's a biased explanation and it's for two or three reasons. One is we're absolutely fundamentally tied. It's called the fundamental attribution error to people explanations as opposed to systems or environmental explanations. This applies in all walks of life, and it's absolutely fundamental in psych psychology. Classic study um, is called the game show study, colloquially, which is where um, the um, participants in the study were asked to just simply watch a game show and then rate who was most intelligent, like the quiz master or the contestants. And they all said the quiz master was like, more intelligent. They've got the answers in front of them. <laughs> It's the ultimate environmental like cause, but we, we 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 so much want to attribute things to human beings. It's, oh, they're very 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 intelligent there, quizmaster, because they can say 18th century. I don't think so, you know. So this th this is pr quite profound. We cannot see systems. We want to blame people within systems. So, yeah. So. So the, yeah, it's, it's the pop music business that gives rise to this behaviour, but we want to say something about these people, about oh, they're exhibitionists or something, you know. And it's the same with the blokes, you know. They, have a, they affect the norms of the system, but but we want to somehow attribute personal values to people, and, and as well as the individual, it's called behaviour engulfs the field, right? We ignore 
we ignore technology and design and we, we focus on behaviour. We also deeply tied to the proximal, so it's not just the behaviour of anyone, it's the behaviour of people on the front line. And Albert Michaud, these are a one, this is a wonderful series of experiments on perception of causality. Um, I used to have the book on my desk at uni and I got the French version because like, it made me look like exotic, you know. So rather than, so I got <laughs> la perception on the because I could understand the pictures because you know it's quite pictorial sort of like. So I just left that lying about. And what Michaud did was he presented shapes on a screen, and he would have them move. Right, there's no causality here. He is manipulating all this, the, the shapes, and so he'd have a block go like this, and go like that, two blocks, and, and ask people what they saw. He said, "Well, this one bumped this one out the road." Okay, fine, yeah? And then he would do this. And, and ask people what they saw. And he said, well, that two, they would describe it as two independent events. This happened, and then this happened. Like the causal link was gone. And there's all sorts of different ways he manipulated it, if you, a special as well. So that and that is seen as independent. So... We attribute causality to events that are close in time and space to what happens. So I'm afraid if you're the person with the scrubs on, or the syringe in your hand, or the uniform that says nurse or something on it, you're the one that's going to be attributed in terms of causality of an event. The number of the spatial separation of, say, management decisions and so on, and the, and the time that's gone means that people simply don't, can't see that as a cause. That's just the way the mind works. So, so that's why human error is always the first point of call. I used to do railway safety, train drivers, you know, hands on the wheel, go through a red light, you know, driver blunder, error. Irrespective of the restructuring of the signalling systems and the fact that that light had been passed by 10 drivers in the last two months, nobody had done anything about it, and the foliage obscuring it, and all the design factors. If you're the person holding the wheel, you're the person that's going to essentially feel the pull of the attribution. It's very important. So, because patient safety is, is like that. Because the people bit plus the proximal bit means errors and break malfunctions, if you like. You get technical failures too at the front line, are essentially what we focus on. And that's why I wrote a book like a long time ago now, it's called Beyond Human Error. You know, trying to sort of say we have to try and look at the way the systems work as well. You know? And I'll just have to do this that, that there's, a, there's a deep philosophy in safety and it's come to be termed sort of safety one by people who consider these things and you'll guess there's a safety two again which is starting to become things something that people talk about and um, this is our own conceptualization the model is by a professor called Eric Holnagel in, in southern Denmark but this I or the, the schematic of safety one and two this is some of our own stuff but um, Essentially, safety has its, and this is right throughout safety science history for 100 years, never mind healthcare, um, safety has as its core this idea that success comes when everything is okay. This is sort of as simple as that. So you have a design capacity, you've got staff, equipment, procedures, and you've got demands, that's your patients and their acuities and their needs, and the system is designed, of course, that the demand meets the capacity. And when everything goes well, you have safety. The same thing applies to quality. Okay, seems plausible enough. And then it goes wrong where something is awry, there's misalignment. So we've got staff shortage, equipment breakdown, patients suddenly come in in huge numbers, got epidemics or whatever, and so on. That's, that's what causes failure. Okay? Because it's looked at this way, of course, what you then do is you don't have to do anything about this. This is fine, this is normal operations going as intended. What you do is you have to look at the failures, that's why you investigate your root cause analysis and so on, and you try and fix the misalignments that you find, uh, the, 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 the failures and so on, and then you get back to the successful situation. That's, that's kind of what we call safety one, that good things come from perfect operations minus the failures. Safety two has it actually that there's no such thing as perfect operation. These, this, Actually, these things are always challenging. There's always problems with capacity. Or always someone, there's always equipment that's not working or not fit for purpose or nobody wanted it in the first place. And there's always problems with patient lists and, 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 and patient um, 
not who, who perhaps the service is not intended to meet the demand and, and so on. Various different interests and goals that are never quite aligned. And therefore, what's important is the constant attempt to battle the system, if you like, to do the to do a good job within the messy situation, not, not, not to iron all out all the bumps and have a utopia. And that's the thing that's understudied, and, and success comes from that. But we really un- we understudy the kind of things like adaptations, adjustments, innovations, positive deviance, all these terms are in there, right? how people actually make things work, make do with really difficult situations. And failure comes from the same system. Now, this is the model then of like, resilient healthcare, that, which is the other name for safety too, there's a long history there, that, that success comes from a constant cycle of adaptation, adjustment, learning, monitoring, responding to a system that's dynamic and difficult and complex. And that's really what's going on. And every now and again, of course, the failure has happened as well. And we must therefore learn from success as well as failure. And we must study everyday work rather than just the situations where it has supposedly gone wrong. So that's kind of like all, there are very, I always operate on the assumption that if you're interested at all that you'll get in touch. And there are various publications that are open access about this idea of trying to look at safety slightly differently, including that one. Um, and uh, again, so I mentioned this, but the, the, the guidelines are, are, are part of the same system and they tend to ignore the context. One of the things we're looking at is flow through the emergency department at St Thomas's Hospital th- uh, in a health foundation project, but a major cohort study of, of patient spells. And again, so if you think of the, guide, like the guidelines around decision making, there's things about triage decisions, diagnostic, referral, calling for specialist input and things and then making decisions as to what how you should dispose and so on. So the guidelines just say all that stuff. They don't mention, of course, the tar- they don't mention the, the, the four hour target, which looms incredibly large in the cognitive landscape of people. So people are making those decisions, but they've all at least there are tensions within the specialties, but everybody's got an eye on the on the clock. And if you want to predict whether people will go through the de- when people will leave the department, you all know this. You just need to, and these are our survival curves. You just need to look at the time. So that your chances of being in the department, that's the survival, drops right off at four hours, and your chances of leaving, the, hazard, the risk of leaving, just absolutely spikes. So it's not just about how you're triaged or what's going on or what tests and so on. It's about the system. It's absolutely overwhelming. And we modelled all sorts of variants and adaptations that people have to make to all, all sorts of things within the system. And I, I can't go through this in any detail, but your odds of like breaching the four-hour target, which was this about, absolutely like uh, depend on which, which shift you arrive in, which location is your first location in the department. Do you go into majors or resource or minors? Of course, it depends on other numbers, uh, the, the load on the system, but that's not the only thing. You've got all these other things as well. The, the most problematic primary presenting complaint, does anyone want to guess what that is? For, length, for, being, for breaching the four-hour target? Unknown. <laughs> <laughs> So these are early load, these are what we call triggers on the system. If people come in and you don't know what's wrong with them, you, know, you, you can start to build up a picture that you're maybe loading the system and you're going to be in trouble. I can talk about that in detail for anybody that's interested. All sorts of things about agency staff, all predictive. And we have odds ratios for everything. And specialty input is hugely variable in terms of how long it's going to take. So when people are making a decision, I need someone, that's Harrison is the HIV unit, I need someone from there, or I need some mental health input, or I need someone from uh, Obs and Gynae, the, the, the decision is not equal because you know if you call for help in some areas, it ain't going to come for a long time. So you're balancing. Uh, come back to this at the end. You're balancing organisational decisions with your clinical ones. Of course you are. And that's a, this is an example of that. Um, in diabetes <coughs> care, um, this is our work here, you make decisions and they are about patients and clinical aims that, which lead to care plans and treatments and processes and outcomes. But they're also about things like making sure things are kept moving. Well, of course they are. And they're about training. 
relying on it's about training and they're about things like space, physical space and resources so this is the stuff of er ergonomics and everybody's always you always have to balance efficiency and thoroughness you cannot cannot spend all your time doing absolutely the best for every patient that you've got because the organisation simply will not allow that. If you doubt that, just try it one day. Just say, I'm going to spend my whole shift looking after one patient because it's in their best interests. You know, and you'll soon find out how the organisation will, will react to that. Okay. Um, so, be, because, because of all that, because we ignore the organisational aspects and the ergonomic aspects and we focus on people at the front line and proximal things, and we're not really very sure what patient safety is because it's really a goal. It often comes down just to telling people patient safety is a lot of patient safety is like be safe, you know. <sighs> you know, it's a bit of an advocacy thing. You know, um, like it matters and we should stand up. And nobody disagrees with that, but that's not gonna get us there. It's not gonna help the process. We set targets and of course they're always low or high. Nobody ever set a target at twenty six and a half. So it's always never of zero or millions. That's what you have to do in order to inspire. And then you have all this, you put safety in the middle of, of anything you like. You just put safety in the middle and then just <laughs> scatter things around with no evidence whatsoever. These are not evidence-based links. These are just like diagrams. And then we have culture and focus <coughs> and like scope. And then we have all the stuff about speaking out that doesn't take um, cognizance of the, the social and organisational difficulties of speaking out very much it's sort of, it more, it more or less here is just an appeal to your sort of professional and ethical duty and it's, that is not going to do it, again that speak, getting people to speak up and speak out is a goal and we need to work out what the barriers are and then address the interventions to fit the barriers, you need to understand the system so I'm just going to pause for water and show you a short film that lasts a couple of minutes um, and I'll just click the mouse here. So this is just a, a wee psychology film about speaking up. The ASH experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example... If you the actors right have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is to... Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The ASH experiment has been repeated many times and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat, so we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we'll still go along. One. 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 Group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. Uh, one. You know, we, you need to study the group dynamics, again, if you want to facilitate people being able to feel free to speak their mind. I know this is obvious to you. I've never replicated that experiment, but I have replicated some of the hairstyles that... Um, <laughs> that I was doing, like, uh, doing me. Um, yeah, so you know, you get this, be smart, be aware, be wise. Is wise and smart and aware, are they, are they the same things? And of course you've not to forget, and you've to remember, is that the same thing? And it's in your hands, so, uh, but, and it starts with you, but it's also about us all. And you, you just get this kind of endorsement of safety, and everybody, it's a bit like world peace, everybody wants it, but you really need to work on the process. And you have moments, and 
Now I'm getting ridiculous, but safety moments, safety days. Guess what's next? Yeah, it's safety <laughs> days. Yeah. And safety month. And then, and then ultimately, of course, in Scotland, we are sensible. We go for 24-7 and 365 days a year, all of which leads me to want a bit of a time out. Um, I believe psychology has a lot to answer for here. Um, so, quickly. Um, so, so, but safety science starts off treating you like rats, okay? So it's about conditioning, so punishment and reward. That's, how, that's behavioral safety, and that's where safety starts. Around the 50s, Chomsky demolished behaviorism and said it was gross and superficial, right? When they tried to apply it to human language. And he was right, but unfortunately at that time, artificial intelligence had just been kind of invented. And so every psychologist not being the brightest tools in the box, ah, we're not rats, we're computers. And now, so you get psychology ever since has been dominated by cognitivism, which has you as information processing devices. So now nobody is trying to condition you to behave in certain ways. They're trying to program you. They're trying to program you. Seriously. This is, this is deep. So psychology now looks like this. And, it's bec and, and, and of course, the, the brain doesn't work like this. The brain more works like this. You know, this is like the social model. Like, you know, like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have time to read that later if you like. But that satire is important because it pokes fun at something. We know we're not technical, rational automatons. We know that we interact in social ways in our environment. And there's a whole psychology now around how con cognition and decisions are distributed in social systems and embodied in our physicality, but it's ignored. And it's because of that, it's because, this is true, okay, you just have to trust me, because it's because of that we think behaviour is rule bound, like computer, computers are, that you get algorithmic social like, rules to try and program you how to behave. It, it really, the you know, history of this is this is why it happened. But that's not how the system works. That's just a map. That's, but the, that, the idea is you just yes, no gates everywhere. But that's not how people behave. Even in French. You know, triage, pediatric. So there's a myth of full specification that if you just specify all the steps that people want. And this, you know, you can't rely on guesswork. You can't cross the road without guesswork, you know. <laughs> so this is why everything's in steps, like three or four or five or six or seven you know, steps, you know. <laughs> and so these algorithms are not the territory, they're not the system, they're not the way the world works, they're just tools, and some of them are called tools, and that's how they should be treated, but the way they should treat them is, here are some rules that may or may not help in this situation, see how you get on, rather than if you don't do this, you know, there will be consequences, because that's not the way that, you, the dynamic system means you often have to adapt rules, guidelines, heuristics to suit context. So you're mapping your territory. And we studied um, lots of this, and, and th this is about escalation policy in the ED, which I don't have time to go into, but this is just that, which you can't read, obviously. A list of the, the minutiae of escalation. It's not just escalate, don't escalate, based on numbers. People all the time are mini escalations everywhere, reconfiguring equipment, flexing staff, constantly upgrading and downgrading the status in their minds to try and get things done. And lovely Bob Weirs, who died last year, wrote an editorial on our paper, it was lovely, called The Secret Life of Policies. And he said that frontline workers finish the design, I love this. And they make on-the-fly adjustments in context. I mean, that's just life, that's what we do. So, that's called the difference between workers imagined and workers done. So, a I'm not bad for time. I've got 10 minutes or so to finish it. So what should we be teaching then? Well, I said this at the beginning. I think, I think rather than sort of let's teach patient safety, let's stick to what we're doing and you will all have your own conceptions of what the rest of the curriculum is like and I know bits of it, but people need scientific knowledge and clinical skills, obviously, and preclinical and then clinical. And then I think I've said research and evaluation, so I think a little bit of a sensibility for data and interpretation, critical appraisal. QI type methods and so on. So you, we know roughly if we're doing well, we can sort of interpret that. And then I think we should teach human factors, also known as the ergonomics. <coughs> the physical, the cognitive, and the organizational. Um, yeah, science of work. That's what I think we should teach. That's work system. These are work system problems, and we need to teach the science of work. 
and uh, this I can't remember who said that. I don't know why that's there, but somebody said it's about making it easy to do the right thing, rather than just telling people that, to do the right thing or where we are trying to get to. Let's design it in. And uh, yeah, the physical, the cognitive, and the, uh, the organisation. So physical ergonomics, you kind of know what all this is, but uh, you're talking about what the stressors, what causes stress and fatigue. Um, some of th some of that's biomechanical musculoskeletal problems, dentists very well known, these impact on your decision, how can we design tasks to make things easier um, and what are the affordances in all the objects and the artefacts that we deal with every day that lead to errors and so on. This is my grandfather Johnny Ross <laughs> right. um, so he was a harmonica uh, player and he had a band called Johnny Ross and the Harmonichords he had, he, had one, he had one advantage in, in this career path that he, that he, he, he embarked on. Do you know what it was? He had no teeth. So he used to take his top teeth out and stick them in his left pocket, and then his bottom teeth out and stick them in his right pocket, and then blow his heart for all he was worth. You know? So, like, you know, unintended consequences of devices. One of the things about getting dentures is you can, you can blow a harmonica, you know. And so this is your physical ergonomics, and like I say, we need to design. <coughs> Too much of it, again, it's just that. Whatever you do, don't step on that button. Well, let's think about the button, you know. And I don't work in a safety-critical um, environment, but I do have a house that has both crunchy peanut butter and tahini, which is the stuff you make hummus with, in the same labelled. And believe me, you don't, but you don't want to spread tahini on your toast in the morning, like munch into it, you know. <laughs> So you have to think about the design, the, as you know, the labelling, the layout. And one of the things I do is like walk people through. Um, and one of the principles of design is you cannot eliminate all hazards in healthcare. So um, um, you have sharp instruments, okay? That's a hazard. You can't get rid of them. You can't have blunt instruments. It's a simple fact. So you, what you have to do is manage the risk, not eliminate some of the risks. And uh, yeah, so that's just me. And um, so. One of the things we do, for example, with the physical ergonomics is we walk people through and get them to do a hazard assessment, essentially, um, um, a systematic examination of the risks. So here's um, a local decontamination unit and a nurse entering the, the door. This is, a, this is not ours, this is someone else. So she's pushing the door open from this side. And when, you go, when she goes in, you see the door opens this way and you're straight into the green zone, so you're straight into the clean instrument zone. The room, the room is basically the wrong way around. The door opens like that and you present the dirty tray to the green right side instead of the red side. And the, the cycle which tells you which way around this thing is is on the inside of the door, not on the outside. So you're in, you're in before you can read that, if you ever turn around and read it. And so, yeah, the... The, and that's the blow up of the picture. So the picture goes like clockwise and the, the zoning goes anti clockwise, you know, just error traps everywhere. So we try and get our students to understand the sensibilities of these kind of physical uh, aspects. The cognitive I've talked about, um, you know, again, priority decisions, what are the biases and the error traps and all the decisions people make scientific evidence-based decisions and based on patient preferences and values and wishes but also based on workflow and cost and, and deeply decisions are deeply embedded in the procedures and decision tools that you give people so that's all um, important and error is of course a big part of cognitive ergonomics. so when are people likely to be distracted and make slips and lapses and when are they likely to not have full information and have to make guesses and make mistakes and all that kind of stuff. Can you find the mistake here? Hand, yeah, well, well, I can see one smile, two, yeah, three, four, three. Hands up where you got it. You don't have to go like that, but just a wee, a wee. <laughs> right, so there's two, there's. Yeah, so well done over there. I think you were with first, you know. So that you can you can design people to fail any time you like. It's actually really easy, you know. And I led you into it by saying, "Can you find the mistake?" So I gave you the question. So you think, "Well, I'll disregard that bit and you'll look at the bottom for the salient because it's colours and numbers. You, there's all sorts of cognitive biases. <laughs> this is inherent in all work systems. I won't do that one. 
<laughs> and then I finish. It's just because I'd like to finish in like sort of five, five, seven, like <coughs> ten, two. I think we started. Because right? um, I like to talk about organisational economics, where I do a lot of my work. This is basically the sort of system design things. And you ha you have to go wider than sometimes the work, the clinical work system that you're in, whatever that might be. Mine would be things like preventive dental practice or dental care in care homes. Sometimes you have to look at the wider structures. Mm -hmm. But this is basically kind of work systems analysis. And I mentioned the, work, the difference between work as imagined and work as done. So you've got your procedures, your documents, the way that care is intended, this idea of alignment that I talked about. And all the evidence is that after your planning and review stages, that basically there's a divergence in terms of how, what actually happens. And you always have to go back out and work out how your model is working in the field. Sometimes that's relatively close and sometimes it's a cavern, you know, cavernous gap, a chasm, you know. And so organisational ergonomics has all your non-technical skills in it, which is something that the simulation community obviously has long been interested in. And I just talk through a couple of projects just to finish. One of the things I'm doing is looking at care home, um, oral care and care homes under Scotland's national programme called uh, <coughs> Caring for Smiles. And the imagined world, like the guideline, is pretty straightforward. You have to go in Caring for smiles, and you have to do twice daily oral like, assessment, mouth checks for things like dry mouth and lesions and so on, and tooth brushing, basically oral hygiene. It's really simple, really simple. And the clinical academics and the professors of dental public health cannot understand why staff just for some reason just can't follow this simple guideline. And you go and talk to staff, they say, oh, yeah, caring for smiles, yeah, we had that on a Monday. And then, and then we had something about nutrition, and then we've got something about, I think, falls and fractures, and then we've got something about, like, medicine safety, and then we've got moving and handling, and, of course, we've got continence and fluid intake, and then all sorts of aspects to do with personhood and patient-centred care, and then and, and all sorts of... So, so, and that's the, the, the complexity of the landscape is what gives rise to the outcome. You have to study the system and how all those things impact and who's doing them and when and how you're going to achieve. You need to design, I, I, was my pitch when I got funded, you need to design this protocol into the system and see how to do it, not what to do or why. So obviously we know what to do, that's, your, that's the procedures, and why? Well, it's because we don't want bad conditions, but, but how to do it is always part of the work system analysis. So that's the funding. Um, to improve the system of care and we're asking questions like what demands do the protocols place on staff how do you coordinate care and what opportunities exist for designing and supporting the clinical care we're doing that via work systems analysis adapted for the care home sector which is classic human factors technique at, at, at these five levels and I am whizzing through it but goals, so what are we trying to achieve in something like the oral care system, is it is it about, say, are they thinking about avoidance of disease or is it something to do with personal care and appearance? So the various different values. How will we know, you know, that we're achieving things? So are we actually going to take clinical outcome measures from people who are essentially somewhere near the end of life? Or can we do it in a slightly more kind of less interventive way? How do we know it's functioning? And what are the professional aspects? So, you know, do, do staff see this as like part of their job and all that? Main activities, the key functions, relatively small set of key functions we want to support, and then all the supporting activities. So, you know, like you've got to, you, you might want to, a key function be to examine the mouth. Well, we need light, we need a chair, we need some sort of physical space, we need water, we need, might need latex gloves, but we had them in a cabinet at the bedside, but then someone ate a glove. This is true. So now we have them in a locked cabinet like 20 yards away. <laughs> so we got someone with dementia. And we, we struggle to get them to accept us looking in the mouth, but today they're smiling and it looks like, yeah, can I look in your mouth? Yeah, okay. Shit, I've not got the latex gloves. So I've got to run down the corridor, sign them out or whatever, and get back and, and lose the moment. That's the stuff of care. Like that, what are you going to do then is where decisions happen. So, again, supporting activities which get your resources utilised to facilitate what we're trying to achieve. And then resources. So what basically that includes your skills and capabilities, but also your time, your space, your funding, all those things. That's that work system analysis gives rise to a lot of good, I think, um, kind of information for intervention. And then um, the work system mapping was what we're that's the stage we're at now. 
and there's the map. Um, that's the map. Um, and yeah, I think I probably missed the last. No, well, do will I do the last one? Two minute, one minute, yeah. two minutes. Um, the second thing is a, a quality improvement intervention, just to make the point. So fluoride varnish. Again, this is the same principle, so I'm just repeating myself. Fluoride varnish, does anyone know what that is? So, so it's, it's, it's the magic toothpaste. So it's 22,500 parts per million toothpaste that you stick on kids' teeth. And in Scotland, we, do, we don't have water, fluoride in the water supply. And it stays on for a while. And it's, got, it's clinically proven to pre prevent caries. It was, it was a government target that 60% of two to five-year-olds would get it twice a year. And only 18% are getting it. So I was charged with trying to find out why. Again, the dental public health consultants think, simple, we'll pay dentists. So they introduced a payment or item of service fee for it and it didn't spike. It just went up a tiny little bit and then fell back down. So what's going on? The answer is the work system, the answer is human factors is going on. So um, I pulled together all sorts of data on size of practice to see if that was a factor and people with more than one surgery were maybe managing to do it off more often surveyed dentists, workshops with dentists, nurses, coordinators of the Child Smile program that, that administers this, lots of interviews, and came up, with this, came up with this. This is an activity model of 31 functions closely tied to the one in the middle, which is apply varnish. So applying varnish takes place within all these other activities that are important, like running a business, of course, managing your surgical time and space, interpreting the evidence and the guidance and doing the research around that, dealing with two-year-olds, small child in a big chair, patient consent issues, preferences, getting families into practice, and then all the stuff around the IT, loads of stuff around the IT systems and so on. And that's, that's the work system. So the, the punchline is, in order to intervene, you need to find people that know how to work the system. So we're now designing that intervention with practitioners who are selected for applying very high rates of varnish, and they are walking us through the functions in each area. And we're going to produce a toolkit with them, along with kind of non-clinical audit stuff, so human factors kind of stuff about how to, how to audit your own work system, basically, to see how you can facilitate these functions happening in order that the varnish can emerge. And we're making it available as an audit and so on. So the answer is that it's, it's complex. And that's where I'll finish, that, that we sort of like, you need to look at any given activity within a systems approach, the cognitive and the social and the organisational and the technical, and, that's, and the intervention follows from that. And whew, I better just stop there. I, could, I can talk all night, but I won't, so thank you for listening to, the, to what I had to say. <laughs>